It's recording. La 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 la. Test. Yes. We're just waiting because Luke has to MacGyver his whole operation to work in our precarious situation as we're staying in a guest room in an elderly person's home. Senior apartments. Senior living apartments. And it is everything you would think it would be. There are a million towels and a million sheets. It's very nice. It's very nice. It's Nicest very hotel we've ever stayed in. Definitely. And we get these cute little rocking chairs that we're sitting in right now. Um, and we're the furthest away we've ever been while recording, which means less feedback, hopefully, whenever Luke finally does. Yeah, less get feedback, but like probably more noise on my mic in general. Right, also, I think I'm good. I think I'm going to have to be quiet because I feel bad because like we're in a senior living home and people are probably sleeping right now because it's late. So I guess we'll just be doing ASMR podcast today. Hey guys, welcome back to Is Fitz Happy. I'm Emma and that's Luke. Welcome back to another episode of Is Fitz Happy. I'm Luke. I'm Emma. And this week we're discussing chapter four, Bonds. Our first long chapter of the Mad Ship. Yeah. Also, weirdly, Brashen is in this, and I don't quite understand Bonds, but we'll talk about it when we get to it. <laughs> All right, so we start out with Wintrow. Of course, he's on Vivacia as well, and he is on a mission. He is approaching Brig kind of sizing him up before he approaches him to ask him some questions. Right. And we find out that Brig is only 25, so he's pretty young compared to a lot of the other pirates on board. But he is in charge and he has an air about him that even though he's young, it's very direct. Yeah. Other people do jump to it and Wintrow thinks Kenneth chose well in assigning Brig to step up because you know, no more than a couple of weeks ago or last week, he was just an ordinary seaman and now he's promoted. Yeah. So he seems to be pretty competent and a good sailor at least. Yes. And so Wintrow approaches him, says, I need to ask you some questions and asks how much longer will it be to Bull Run Creek? Day and a half, Brig tells him after a brief consideration, maybe two. Wintrow nods to himself, saying, I think we can wait that long. There are supplies I need there because we haven't been able to find the medical chest here. It's missing or maybe ransacked in the uprising. Can you find it for me, basically? <laughs> right. And Brig asks if anyone has owned up to taking it already. And Wintrow has this moment of saying, you know, I've asked everybody, but nobody really wants to talk to me. And he kind of thinks it's because Sa'adar is turning the slaves against him. Right. But then realizes that while he's saying this, it kind of sounds like he's just whining and that won't get Briggs respect. So he also ends it with, I know that it could still, it could also be lack of trust and I think that this is necessary because without it, Captain Kennett will be way more uncomfortable. He also gives a little bit more of a, an out to the sailor or the former slaves saying that maybe they just don't know what they have. Right. But hearing Captain Kennett would be much more comfortable with it. He orders some sailor to go around and look for it, ask after it. Right. The sailor's name is Kaj, C-A-J. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we really hear about him ever again. I but. don't think so. He is a sailor under Kennet. <laughs> Wintrow is about to ask after his father, but then they spot a ship. A Chalcedian galley, but flying the flag of the satraps patrol. They're coming up fast with oars and sail. They must have been laying back in that inlet. Damn, Briggs spat. He did it. He brought in Chalcedian mercenaries. Clear the decks, working crew only, everyone else below and out of the way. And of course... Then 
everything becomes an issue. <laughs> All the uh, the former slaves have to move down below. It's a clear out. Everything is becoming like an ant's nest that was kind of kicked up because it becomes super busy on deck. And Wintrow is rushing towards Vivacia because she doesn't really know what's going on. Right. And she does ask for clarification of why Chalcedians would be flying the flag of Jamalia because it is really strange. I think at this point, we know that Bingtown isn't a fan of Chalced and that they are kind of rivals because right. they have a border that they share. But I don't think that the Chalcedian, the Chalcedians have a good reputation in Jamalia either. No, I don't think, at least not before Satrap Cosgo. Right. So I think it's kind of a tumultuous relationship even for them. It's not just Bingtown that has a problem with them. Yeah. And so she asks after it and Winter replies, I heard some rumors that Satrap Cosgo hired Chalcedians to patrol the inside passage. They're supposed to clear out pirates, but that doesn't explain why they'd pursue us. A moment. And he climbs up into the riggings to try to see some more of what is going on. And this is something that we've also pointed out every time it's brought up because it has been brought up by multiple different characters throughout Ship of Magic and I think even once before this in this book. So they finally have evidence that Jamalia has brought in outside mercenaries to hunt pirates. Right. And, well, that's supposedly what they're doing. But clearly in this moment, they're chasing a seemingly traitor. Yeah, because it vessel. is a live ship and they're not flying Kenneth's flag. Right. So, and Ken, or sorry, Wintro notes that this is a warship. This is not meant for doing right. trade or easy business. This is the Chalcedians coming to start some drama, a fight. I mean... It makes sense. You wouldn't bring a trade ship to be a patrol for pirates. Right, definitely. Definitely, but it's still Chalcedians and they're still sketchy. And this is what brings on at least the final straw that broke the camel's back for Bingtown. Right. To kind of rebel against this. They refuse these Chalcedian patrols uh, access to the docks eventually. Right. And this is explained by Vivacia because she says it doesn't make sense that the satrap would invite Chalcedians into their waters because it's like asking a thief to guard your warehouse. Which also seems kind of xenophobic. (laughs) Yeah, apparently Chalcedians are not trustworthy, according to Vivacia, which we know is probably what the Vestrits think and probably why Althea believes that um, Kyle is is awful. (laughs) Yeah. But, I mean, yeah. to be fair, the Chalcedians that we do see are pretty much all awful. <laughs> yeah, it it's not like we have seen any that disprove the stereotype right. in this book series. And it's really interesting because we never get any perspective from a Chalcedian. We only see Chalcedians through non-Chalcedian lens and through people who are directly affected by the negative of a like what the Chalcedians are doing. Yeah, I think we get some point of view of Chalcedians in the last trilogy, mm. but just sparing chapters, like one right. or two, okay. I think. <laughs> yeah, that would be the only place for it, I suppose. Yeah, either but that those... or Rainwild Chronicles with Selden. Fair. And the I don't remember the Duke's daughter, mm. whatever her name is, so... That might be the only other place. So either way, we know that Chalcedians are not necessarily look favored upon by at least the people of Bingtown. Right. And Vivacia is outraged that this would even happen. Yeah. And uh, Wintrow is kind of curious of what, what's going to happen next. He's, he's wondering what would be better? Should I tell Vivacia to lag behind so we get overtaken by the Chalcedian warship? And if the Chalcedians win, maybe they return us to the rightful owners and I could get free that way. But lots of bloodshed that leads that way. Or do right. I tell her to flee because lots of bloodshed? Right. And the bloodshed is going to come because everybody knows if the Chalcedians take over the ship, the 
currently freed slaves would become slaves once again and would be made, it would just be taken back to be sold again. Right. So they're going to fight. Right. And the pirates aren't going to want to give up easily either. Yeah. And big battle. Yeah. It does make me a little bit sad that Wintrow is debating letting the Chalcedians come on board even with the bloodshed because Fivatia has so openly multiple times, both to him and to the whole crew, talked about how horrible the bloodshed has been for her and how she is literally taking the deaths of those people and their lives are with her forever. So the this is where uh, the meme that you just posted on our Instagram really comes into focus in the text for this next chapter, saying, yes. A great deal of bloodshed, he decided. So, should he urge Vivacia to flee or dawdle? Before he could even voice his uncertainty, the decision was snatched from him. And that's just kind of Wintrow in a nutshell. Yes. <laughs> Thinks about it so long that someone else makes the decision, and that's kind of what he likes. Yeah. But anyways, uh, Marietta kind of comes in to steal that decision. The Chalcedian warship is gaining on them because they also have oars with slaves on them. But Marietta comes over and goes gets really close, looses some catapults, and kind of taunts them, creates havoc on deck, and entices the Chalcedian ship to chase after it. Also, most importantly, the Marietta, Marietta changes the flag in the middle of this to show the raven flag so that they know the Marietta is a flag under Captain Kennet. Yes, and this is Sorcor who is captaining the Marietta at this point as a reminder. Yes, so that is why it would be enticing, not just because another ship is attacking them, but also because of who they think it might be. Right. And it does cause commotion where the chalcedian ship then decides to go after kenneth's flag which does make wintrow pause and wonder who captain kenneth is exactly to cause this change in direction of the ship also to command the loyalty of the men to distract from actual captain kenneth who might die right and just like oh we'll put the danger on ourselves and draw them away yeah so a lot of a lot of questions for wintrow of just what is going on and who is Kennet. Mm -hmm. I think I also wanted to point out that the Chalcedian warship being described here is very similar to the warships that the people of the six duchies use, at least from what little is described, but with a bunch of people on rows or on oars, sorry. Yeah. Rowing. With sails as well. Yeah. With sails. That's, kind of what Fitz described to us whenever he was working on a ship for war. And I just found that really interesting. And I wonder if everyone in this time period is using that kind of ship, if it's for fighting purposes. Yeah, I think so. Because the red ships, I think, were described a very similar way. Right. Where they had oars and... So I was wondering if that was like cultural to these three groups, or is this just what everybody does? And it the reason it's so different is because currently Winter is on a merchant ship. I think it's that reason, particularly. I think for war, including the oars in there, gets you faster than just sailing. (laughs) And you can maneuver a little bit easier, too. Reverse and turn. True. So that decision taken away, the Chalcedian ship is chasing after the Marietta. Wintrow is straining to sea, but can't really. So he clambers down and... Tries to update Vivacia, but Vivacia interrupts and isn't really in the moment, I guess, with him and says, Kennet. What about him? Wintrow asked. Boy, the woman's sharp voice from be- came from behind him. He turned to see Etta glaring at him. The captain wants you now. She was speaking to Wintrow, but her eyes were not on him. And her gaze was locked with vivacious. The figurehead's face grew suddenly impassive. Wintrow, stand still, she ordered him softly. Vivacia lifted her voice to speak to the pirate. His name is Wintrow Vestret, she pointed out to Etta with patrician disdain. You will not call him boy. Vivacia shifted her eyes to Wintrow. She smiled at him benignly and politely observed, I hear Captain Kennet calling for you. Would you go to him, please, Wintrow? 
Immediately, he promised her and complied. As he walked away from her, uh, walked away from them, he wondered what Vivacia had been demonstra- demonstrating. He would not make the mistake of thinking that she had been defending him from Etta. No, that exchange had been about the struggle for dominance between two females. In her own way, Vivacia had asserted that Wintrow was her territory and that she expected Etta to respect that. At the same time, it had pleased her to reveal to the woman that the ship was aware of what went on in the captain's stateroom. From the spasm of anger that had passed over Etta's features, he deduced she was not pleased by it. I think what's really interesting about this exchange is it really highlights something that Hobb does a lot in this trilogy, particularly, maybe because there's more females in this trilogy than the last, but there's a sense of women being against each other and always trying to have the upper hand against the other woman. Yeah. And I think that motif is kind of repeated with various different women throughout the series. And it's so interesting. Malta and Ronica. Kefria and Ronica. Althea and... and Kefria. Yeah. <laughs> You know, Malta and Kefria as well. Yes. <laughs> Malta and Dello. And then here, Etta and Vivacia. Yeah. So it's really interesting to me to see such a difference in female relationships in this book than there or this series than there was in the last trilogy. Because I don't think there was a ton of possessiveness or trying to fix dominance over each other with other examples of females maybe with starling yeah but even that i don't think she was ever trying to be dominant over ketrikin or fighting it was more about the fool and that was more just though they were on equal footing kind of trying to find her footing i guess she kind of thought fool was fool was a woman yeah so there's a little bit of that there but then there there wasn't a lot of women in Buck Keep or Buck in general that we talked about or heard from because it's remarked upon when Ketrickin comes that, oh, they finally have a woman in Buck Keep because they started cleaning stuff. Right. <laughs> all the servants have actually cleaned out the cobwebs from all the rooms and hallways. Right. I don't know. It's just something that I noticed that I, I'm not particularly a huge fan of, but... Right. I do wonder if it's supposed to be, I mean, this is like really reaching here, but maybe it's supposed to be a commentary on the fact that this society is a little less giving towards women and women are stuck to just a certain role. And so whenever they're faced with another woman that could take some of that freedom that whatever their role gives them they're immediately on the defense and trying to, or offense, I guess, trying to keep the power that they already have. And it's more of a cutthroat thing between the women where, where it isn't in buck keep because women are treated a little bit more fairly. Yeah, I can, can, I can see that the way she writes it too, in general, the first trilogy tradition and social standing is a thing in buck keep. And it's actually a part of Fitz's plot. But in this trilogy, it's written a little bit more subtly, but Mm -hmm. is a part of every single interaction rather than just touched upon once in a while. Right. So I feel like maybe that comes into it, too, where everyone's just kind of like butting heads to get the upper hand in things, the whole traitor part of it. And then there's also, to me, in a lot of Vivacia's and Etta's and Malta's views, in my opinion... Her trying to relate female dragons and what she had in mind in terms of personality right. for them in those characters as well. Kind of preparing us for Tintaglia to overshadow all of them later. Yeah. No, I definitely think that's right. And just this, I don't know, like, I don't love that it's kind of a little catty and petty. Right. But I do think it's an interesting thing to have a lot more strong-willed women maybe that disagree on points that have to butt heads the way that she describes it though just seems kind of archaic yeah and seems like it's put in a poor way i think yeah i think the thing that bothers me is more so the dynamic between etta and vivacia because it feels very like no 
Kenneth's my man. And it's not that's, all that it is, but it yeah. but it does feel like that's the center of it. And I think that's where I'm not loving mm-hmm. the dynamic. Whereas like with Malta and her mother and grandmother, that dynamic is more about a young woman trying to become an adult a little bit too early. And what she thinks an adult is, isn't necessarily what they think an adult is. And I think there's more, there, there's definitely still an aspect of wanting male approval to it, but I don't think that's necessarily the center of it. If that, that could sense. be, that could be just because Wintro is the main observer of the two mm. encounters that we've had with them. True. Because we've had point of views with Vivacia and Etta since they've clashed the first time, but it's mostly just, I don't like that person, you know? Fair. It's yeah. not during the event itself and Wintrow is observing them from like a scholarly, the two females fought for dominance over the uh, herd, yeah. you know? <laughs> like a 14 year old boy scholar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's fair. Yeah. Maybe that is the lens that, and that's why it feels that way because it is a young boy <laughs> seeing two women fight. Right. I don't know. Just something that I've noticed that I think is definitely a pattern that repeats. But yeah. Well, then we have Wintro being sent away here with uh, permission from Vivacia or asking Wintro to go. And he's walking away and he kind of looks back and Etta hasn't moved. He doesn't hear voices, but they're, they could be talking softly. They're just kind of staring at one another still, Vivacia and Etta. And he's once again stricken by how interesting Etta looks. And we get another description of Etta once more. She's probably the most described person in these books. Yeah, she definitely has the coolest vibes. Tall, long limbs, spare of flesh, wore her silk blouse and brocaded vest and trousers as casually as if they were simple cotton garments. Her sleek black hair was cut off short, not even reaching her shoulders. She offered neither roundness nor softness to su- to suggest femininity. Her dark eyes were dangerous and feral. From what Wintrow had seen of her, she was savagely tempered and remorseless as a cat. Not one sign of tenderness had he seen in the woman. Nevertheless, all of those traits contradicted themselves, combining to make her overwhelmingly female. Never before had Wintrow sensed such power in a woman, he wondered if Vivacia would win her battle of wills with Etta. Which is just a very interesting description and kind of the beginnings of young boy's first crush, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really interesting that Wintrow points out that nothing about Etta is what he knows to be what a woman is. Right. But coming it, from a monastery. <laughs> right. Like he definitely has a ton of experience seeing women. Um, but he also, I think it's really important that he also notes that even though she's not what he would think of as a traditional female, quote unquote, she screams femininity and something about her is distinctly a woman and he's never experienced that before. And I think that's good. There's that shows growth of, oh, maybe I've been in a bubble and, you know, like, I don't know everything. I don't know. But I also do like that <laughs> he also has this complicated thing with Vivacia going on where that is more of what a womanly figure is to him. And it's not necessarily something that he has a crush on per se, but there is some sort of bond there. And so I don't know. We get more of their fascinating relationship later though just kind of the beginnings right now yes he walks on into Kenneth's cabin who is calling his name softly repeatedly Wintro affirms that he is there and instinctively takes a grip of Kenneth's hand and kind of almost crushes Wintro's hand while Wintro grabs him in a weird grip deliberately pinching down hard between the th- pirate's thumb and fingers with his other hand he wrapped kenneth's wrist he tried to set his fingers to the pirate's pulse but the man's bracelet was in the way he contented himself with moving his hand to kenneth's forearm rhythmically he tightened then loosened his grip in a slow calming pattern while he maintained the pinch on kenneth's hand 
that was supposed to lessen pain. And he guides him through some breathing exercises, telling him that you can take control of your own body. Pain is only the tool of your body. You can master it. Holding the pirate's gaze with his own, and then Wintro centered himself within his own body, finding a core that touched his heart and both his lungs. He let the focus of his eyes soften, drawing Kenneth's gaze deeper into his own so that he could share his calmness with the man. He tried to make his gaze draw Kenneth's pain out and let it disperse in the air between them. And those exercises brings him back to the monastery, and now he's thinking, what am I doing, mimicking something? I feel a fool. Yeah, so I do want to quick pause and talk about how this sort of healing ritual, whatever it is that he's doing, is number one working, but number two, something different than we have seen yet. Yeah. This is very different to the skill skill healings that we see later, although I think there's some relation because Kenneth, or I guess Wintro is doing something where he's connecting the two of them on some level and using his own breathing and heart rate to calm Kenneth. And maybe alleviate pain. We don't know if that part works much, but at least he does manage to calm Kenneth. Right. And almost lull him to sleep, kind of. It's whatever he's doing is working, but I, I find it very intriguing that this is different than how we've seen any skill. Because I know that we have been kind of throughout this this trilogy trying to decide if what the monastery and the monks use is skill related or if this is a different type of magic being used i still am firmly in this is skill but just different differently taught yeah different technique and different tradition yeah yeah it definitely is very heavy heavily relying on putting your senses and like your vibes i guess into somebody else and sharing the calm from your memory or the content from your memory and there is touch happening, which is really important with skill whenever you want something to be more effective. Obviously, touch creates is not a, necessary. Yeah, it creates a stronger bond. Yeah, but... And it is necessary for certain things. Yeah. At least according to Verity, who can only put his eyes into Wintrow's head with a touch. Uh, fits or his head. Fits his head, excuse me. So, who knows? But then there's... Uh, as he's kind of, Wintrow's going through his head of like, I'm kind of a char charlatan. Am I just trying to save my own skin and trying to make myself believe that it, it's working? And it actually is kind of working. He also says, uh, Sa Parte had spoken of a technique for lending strength to the suffering, but Wintrow's learning had not progressed that far. He had expected to be an artist for Sa, not a healer. Still, as he clasped Kenneth's sweat, sweating hand between his own, he opened his heart to Saw and begged that the father of all would intervene. He prayed that his mercy would supply that Wintrow lacked in learning. And that's interesting too, a technique to lend strength to the suffering. Mm -hmm. I do think it's also really important that in this moment where he is connecting to Kennet and trying to give peace and calm, all of a sudden he's overwhelmed with a sense of not mm, interesting. being good enough and yeah. maybe he is just a charlatan and i wonder if that's because of the connection with kennett and maybe some of kennett's own feeling bleeding in because we know that kennett does think of himself as an actor that he is a lucky person right but he does have a lot of self-doubts and this is very similar to the spiral that kennett goes on sometimes whenever his luck quote unquote fails him it could so, be true so yeah. i wonder if part of that is i mean it's also wintro freaking out because he's 14 and trying to do something that he's never done before and we already know he has a complex anyway so that's what i was more thinking and then because of the calming and maybe lending some of that calm it's not covering up his own insecurities anymore oh i like or that burying it as deeply yeah 
because he's focused on somebody else, somebody else's grievances and somebody else's pain. He can't calm himself at this point. I like that a lot, actually. I was, I like that. I didn't read it like that, but interesting. Either way, he is kind of freaking out, but it is working. Yes. And all of a sudden, Kenneth does speak in a regular voice and says, I can't go on like this. From another man, the words might have sounded pitiful or pleading. Kenneth spoke them as a simple statement of fact. The pain was ebbing, or perhaps his ability to respond to it was exhausted. He closed his dark eyes, and Wintrow suddenly felt isolated. Kenneth spoke quietly but clearly. Take the leg off. Today. As soon as possible. Now. Wintrow shook his head and then spoke the denial out loud. I can't. I don't have half of what I need. Briggs said that Bull Creek is only a day or two away. We should wait. Kenneth's eyes snapped open. I know that I can't wait, he said bluntly. If it's just the pain, then perhaps some rum, Wintrow began, but Kenneth's words overrode his own. The pain is bad, yes, but it's my ship and my command that suffer the worst right now. They sent a boy to tell me of the patrol ship. All I did was try to stand. I fell. Right in front of him, I collapsed. I should have been on the deck as soon as the lookout spotted that sail. We should have turned and cut the throats of every Chelsea and pig aboard that galley. Instead, we fled. I left Brig in command, and we fled. Sorcor had to fight my battle. In addition, all aboard know of it. Every slave on board this ship has a tongue. No matter where I leave them off, every one of them will wag the news that Captain Kennet fled the satrap's patrol ship. I can't allow that. In an introspective voice, he observed, I could drown them all. Wintrow listened in silence. This was not the suave pirate who had courted his ship with extravagant words, nor the controlled captain. This was the man beneath that facade, exposed by pain and exhaustion. Wintrow realized his own vulnerability. Kennet would not tolerate the existence of anyone who had seen him as he truly was. Right now, Kennet seemed unaware of how much he was revealing. Wintrow felt like a mouse pinioned by the snake's stare. As long as he kept still, he had a chance to remain undetected. And Kenneth is slowly, slowly drifting off to sleep. So this is big because Wintro is now privy to the only real glimpse of Kenneth that I think anyone else really gets. Yeah. This kind maybe, of... Maybe Vivacia turned to Bolt later on. But right. yeah, this is the first big one for sure. Yeah, so there's definitely this sense of, oh, wow, this guy is actually way different than the persona he gives off, which I think Wintrow already thought that Kenneth was playing a persona. Right. He didn't believe that whatever Kenneth was doing was who Kenneth really was. But I think seeing it, in this truth of pain on the brink of death is a lot different because it is so honest and vulnerable in a way that Kenneth seems completely unaware of. Yeah. And, and it really speaks to Kenneth's need for control. Yeah. His need to manufacture his image and make sure everyone knows he's perfect. And the insecurities that yes. lie below that of, oh, because of this one thing, People are going to talk and then forever I'll be the guy who ran away from the Chalcedians. Yeah. And I really think that that part relates back to Wintrow calming him down with from his pain mm -hmm. by saying, take control of your body. Pain is only the tool of your body. You can master it. I highlighted that because I think that really made Kenneth actually try to master it. Yes, with I agree. Otherwise, Wintrow just being there and being like, okay, breathe with me, kind of would probably be like, no. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, I also underlined it because I really do did think that is a really good sense of playing to Kenneth's strength of giving him control. And I think because of Kenneth's history and the way he was treated as a child, he does just crave control. There yeah. is that 
need for control of being in control at all times, especially over his own body. <laughs> right. And so I think you're right. Those That choice of word is really what swayed him over to be able to even try and be open to this. And Wintrow does show a lot of awareness of the situation and how much danger he can be in with this because he knows that Kenneth is a dangerous man and tries to just get his way out of it, not bring attention to himself in this vulnerable vulnerable moment. And then Ada walks in. Right. So as Kenneth is finishing up this, he is sort of falling asleep because obviously this has taken a lot of energy out of him. And Wintrow's hoping that he can get away from this by letting him sleep. But with Etta coming in, she immediately demands to know what he did to Kenneth. And he immediately tries to shush her, which she doesn't appreciate. But she does be quiet. Yes. You know. And it waves him over to a different corner so they can be a little bit further from him. So Wintrow slowly, carefully tries to slip away from Kenneth, trying not to jostle him and keep him asleep because at this point, Kenneth hasn't said anything and his eyes are shut. So he assumes he's still asleep, but he is not so lucky because Kenneth wasn't asleep at all. And as soon as Wintrow gets off the bed and isn't touching Kenneth anymore, Kenneth lets him know this is happening now. Get whatever you need ready yeah. and whatever you don't have will have to make do. You will cut my leg off today. Etta gave a horrified gasp. Wintrow turned back slowly to the man. Kenneth had not opened his eyes, but he lifted a long-fingered hand and pointed at him unerringly and says, What you said, gather what you have. We'll make do. One way or another, I want to be finished with this. Wintrow agrees, sir, and moves to the door, changing directions. Etta blocks him. And he's looking up into eyes as dark and merciless as a hawk's. He squared his shoulders for a confrontation. Instead, he saw something like relief in her face. Let me know how I can help you, she said simply. He bobs a nod to her request, too shocked to reply, slips out, walks into the hall, and leans suddenly against the wall, allowing the shaking to overtake his body. He is realizing how... Real this is now. It's actually happening. Yeah. The bravado of his claim when he made the deal with Kenneth now is coming to fruition. Right. And all the details of what he said he needed to do and how he was going to do it. That is real and will be happening. And he doesn't even have the tools for it. But also we get a glimpse here into Etta's view. She's been so irritable, so angry, so upfront because she's terrified for Kenneth who she loves. Yeah. And I think that is really important to point out because she probably feels a lot of guilt because technically it kind of was her doing. I mean, yeah. she saved Kenneth's life. Right. But Kenneth's blaming her. And, and she's going to feel that hurt. Yeah. Yeah. And because of the way she severed his leg, he's now suffering more. And I'm sure she's thinking, why didn't I cut higher or whatever? But either way, I think there is some guilt on her end, deserved or not. And she can feel that relief of, okay, whatever is going to happen is happening. He doesn't yeah. have to suffer anymore. And he made the decision. He's like, yeah, it does have to happen. And that's, and that's something that they, that Sorkor and Etta were trying to convince him of. The doctors were trying to say, but he kind of had to come to that decision himself. Yeah. And we end this Wintrow point of view with him consoling himself by saying that there is no path but forward. And then he goes off to check with Brig to see if anybody has found the medicine chest yet. Praying that they yes. did. Yeah, because that's what he needs. Yeah. And then we move over to Brashen. Yeah. He is drinking with Captain Finney, the captain of the Spring Eve. They're at port and all of the sailors are on leave on shore. And I think there's some like unloading that he's supposed to be overseeing. It's they're getting fresh water. I don't think they're at a port. I think they okay. stopped in an island. Okay. And they're getting fresh water from a place gotcha. that Captain Finney has said there's fresh water. So this is a very impromptu in the middle of the day 
yeah. random island, it feels like. And Brashen should be overseeing it, so he feels a little bit guilty, but the captain asked him to his office, so gotta go. And we are in the middle of a conversation with them. And Captain Finney is complimenting Brashen, saying, you're good at this, you know that? I suppose Brashen reluctantly acknowledged the compliment. The smuggler laughed throatily. But you don't want to be good at it, do you? Brashen shrugged again. Captain Finney mimicked his shrug and then went off into horse laughter. He pushes his mug aside, gets out a humidor of... Um, Sindin. Of Sindin, yeah, thank you, and offers to Brashen, but Brashen shakes his head, declining it because he already has a plug in his mouth. Yes. I also want to say that um, Captain Finney is described as having ferret eyes, and I just find that very funny. <laughs> <laughs> snip, snip. Oh, that's a weasel. Never mind. <laughs> So Brashen has Sinden in right now, and he's wondering if he has enough wit to know that no one was bribed and flattered unless the other party wanted something. He wondered hazily if he would have enough willpower to oppose Finney if necessary. So he knows, you know, his way around a conversation. Captain is bringing him in midday. Says, hey, here's some good Sinden. You're really good at your job. You yeah. know that? Have he's a getting drink. buttered up. Yeah. And... Although he is having this sense of, oh, this isn't just a normal talk, something's going to be offered here, he didn't have enough sense not to drink and use drugs on right. the clock. So, like, he's I don't falling know. into the lifestyle, you know? Yeah. I, I don't know what the insight is good for if he's already fallen for the trap, but sure. <laughs> Finney continues saying, no, you don't want to be good at this trade, as if he had never interrupted himself. And. There's a moment of break, of respite, of them just enjoying what they have in front of them where Brashen thinks that, well, I really should be on shore, but he invited me, so I came to his office instead, and it turned into drinking and sending at midday on his own wash. watch. Shame on you, Brashen Trell, he thought to himself and smiled bitterly. What would Captain Vestret think of you now? He lifted his own mug again. So Finney is looking poking at brash in here just kind of revealing some knowledge that he's learned about brash and saying you want to go back to bingtown don't you you had your wishes that's what you would do because you were quality there you were born from somebody you weren't born to the waterfront so don't try to deny it i know who you are and brash is feeling the effects of the sindin Knowing he should worry that Finney had figured out he was from Bingtown, but he thought that he could deal with it. And Finney says, exactly. He does mention, I don't suppose it matters what I was born to. I'm here now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to that response, Finney says, yeah, see, you are smart. Many men, they can't accept where they end up. They always go moping after the past or mooning toward the future. But men like us... Men like us grab what we're offered and make a go of it. So, you're going to offer me something? Brashen hazarded slyly. And then Finney drops his proposition on there. Not exactly. We can help each other out. Right. So I do want to th say that it is really funny that Captain Finney is saying, Oh, you're a smart man. You don't moon after the past and wish for the a better future <laughs> and it's like mm, every time he gets drunk and high he does actually do that so yeah that is brashen's character yep um i also think that it's really sad to see that brashen in this moment knows how far he has fallen and is thinking of captain vestret and how disappointed captain vestret would be that in this moment this isn't what he could be. This isn't what Captain yeah. Vestret trained him to be. And you can kind of sense that that underlying feeling of disappointment in himself that he is kind of trying to ignore, but it pops that's, up in little ways. That's always Brashen's point of views. Yeah. Always the self-destructive, I'm the worst and I could be so much better and I will be better tomorrow. But right now I need yeah. this. He's... He's really a self-fulfilling prophecy at this yeah. point of <laughs> failure, of I'm a failure, so I'm going to do things that a failure would do. And 
it's because I'm a failure. And I don't know. I just, I do feel really bad for him because obviously Sindin must have some sort of addictive quality to it. And he's struggling oh, yeah. with that. And he does. Or it does. Yeah. So it's just sad because he has come so far from the start of the book and to see him struggle with that and feel that sense of underlying shame that he's trying to brush aside because he still kind of thinks he has control. And I think that's, what's really important is that in this moment, even though we can see all the bad decisions Brashen is making and we can tell he's not, he's not really being super smart about everything. He still is under the idea or the feeling that he is in control of the situation. He's not doing too much. He's not taking too much drugs. He is in control. And we are seeing that he is an unreliable narrative or narrator because clearly the situation suggests otherwise. Right. And so Finney is laying out his propositions, basically setting up the story for the readers uh, that, yeah, you know, I get really good goods to sell the best. Spring Eve goes in and out of these little towns, picks up the finest stuff, and then we sell it. And, uh, I buy stuff, I sell stuff, I don't ask too many questions. Right, exactly. So Brashen in his head is kind of detailing, oh yeah, they they pick up these stolen goods, the best of the pirates' stolen goods, and resell them as a to a go-between in Candletown. And from there, they're passed off as legitimate, legitimate goods in other ports. He didn't really care, he was a mate, and he ends this thought with, in exchange for... Being mate and acting as a bodyguard on occasion, he got his room, board, a few coins, and really some really good sindin. There wasn't much else a man needed. And Finney repeats the best. I get really good stuff, and we take all the risks of getting it. Us, you and I. Then we take that stuff back to Candletown, and what do we get there? Money? A pittance. We bring in a fat pig, and they throw us back the bones. But together, Brashen, you and I could do better for ourselves. How do you figure? This was starting to make him nervous. Finney had an interest in the Spring Eve, but he didn't own it. Brashen didn't want any part of genuine piracy. He'd already done his share of that in early life. He'd had a gut full of it back then. No. This trading in stolen goods was as close as he wanted to get to it. He might, he might not be the respectable first mate of the live ship Vivacia anymore. He wasn't even the hard-working second mate of a slaughter ship like Reaper anymore but he hadn't sunk so low as piracy. You got that look to you, like I said. You are traitor-born, ain't you? Probably a younger son or something, but you would, have, you would have the connections in Bingtown if you wanted to use them. We could take a good haul up there, you would hook us up, and we could trade some top-quality merchandise for some of that magical stuff that the traders have. Them singing chimes and perfumed gems and whatnot. No. Brashen heard too late how abrupt his reply was. Quickly, he softened it. It's a good idea, a brilliant idea, except for one thing. I don't have any connections. In a burst of generosity that was probably due to the Sindin, he gifted Finney with the truth. You're right, I'm traitor-born, but I tangled those lines a long time ago, and my family cut me loose. I couldn't get a glass of water begging at my da's door, let alone cut you a trade deal. The way my father feels about me, he wouldn't piss on me if I was on fire. Finney guffawed, and Brashen joined with a wry smile. He wondered why he spoke of such things at all, let alone why he had made them a cause for levity. Better than being a crying drunk, he supposed. He wonders a little bit about Finney, if he has a father still alive, if he has wife and kids, but he doesn't know anything about the man. And... Finney, of course, continues on. He, Brashen does mention that it's probably better that he doesn't know much about Finney and that if he had any sense, he would get up from this conversation now, leave and make an excuse of needing to be on watch. And instead, he spits the soggy remains of his current send and stick into a bucket under the table and reaches for more. So he's... Actively, More self-destructive. <laughs> yeah, actively not making the best decision here and noting that it's bad. And 
telling Finney who he really is, basically. Right. I think what's really interesting about Brashen is that he is kind of the least ambitious character that we have. I would say Wintro is also not super ambitious, but I think he does have ambitions and he does try to work for a goal or make moves that go towards what he believes in. Whereas I think Brashen really doesn't. Brashen goes with the flow in a way that Wintro in like kind of a similar way Wintro does, but it's not, in the same vein where Wintrow is more anxious and doesn't know how to make a decision. Brashen is actively making decisions and not wallowing in what decision he should be making or what he could be doing. He is noting what he could be doing, but then actively taking steps that are not for his own benefit. (laughs) And it's so odd to have this character who really doesn't aim for a better life, if that makes sense. Right. He's content with his lot in life because he's had it way worse. Yeah. So he doesn't want to rock the boat and go for something more because, one, he doesn't think he deserves it. Right. His self-loathing really gets to him in in his terms of ambition, you know. And two, because he didn't have a lot and he was pretty much homeless for years in between his jobs and lived on Paragon and drinks away his money and doesn't have anything saved. Mm -hmm. He's content with having a pretty good lot in life. Yeah. Of just being a mate, being good at his job. Getting sinned in. Getting sinned in and a little bit of money. Yeah. So I don't know. I just thought that was really important to point out that he is kind of unambitious. (laughs) But Captain Finney is not. And this is an ambitious plan. Because he keeps poking at Brash and saying like, oh... You know, it doesn't have to be your family. You probably know people there, you know? Yeah, there's always a guy in every town who is willing to make some money under the table, under the table yeah. and be hush about how he got it. And there are rumors in towns and you grew up there, so you'd probably know. We could go in there once or twice a year with a load of our very best held back from our usual buyers. Not a lot, but of the finest quality. And that's what we would ask in return confidentially only you and i would need to know brashen nodded more to himself than finney yes the man was planning on going behind his partner's back to make a bit more money for himself so much for honor among thieves and he was quietly offering to cut brashen in on the deal if brashen would help him find the sources it was a low trick how could finney look at him and believe he was that sort of man how long could he pretend he was not What was the point of it anymore? I'll think about it, Brashen told him. You do that, Finney grinned. (sighs) So yeah, again, we conclude this section with Brashen just kind of affirming what we've been talking about. Him being like, I used to be a great man. Yeah. How could Finney think that I was anything but above board and honest? And then just a brief reflection of like, how would he be able to see any of that? Right. I am who I am. So I'll guess I'll think on the deal, maybe. Yeah. And just the sad reflection of how much longer can I pretend, which makes me so sad because I don't necessarily think that it's a pretend. Obviously, there is some delusion in this idea that he is in control and not doing too much and not straying too far from the path. But I do think... At his core, Brashen is a good person. I think he just struggles with addiction. And this drug, Sindin, it messes with your ability to make decisions. And he's taking that drug currently. And it's messing with his ability to make smart decisions and make good choices. And I think it's just really sad to have to watch him struggle with this Mm -hmm. and feel like I really am not a good person and I shouldn't kid myself when that's not necessarily true. I think he is a good person and he does want to be above board. He just keeps putting himself in situations where he doesn't get to be that person. 
Well, we'll break right there. It's a long chapter, and we have a lot to discuss this next section. So if you have any thoughts on this first half, please let us know. You can email us directly at isfitshappy at gmail.com, or you can message us or comment on any of our posts on our social media pages. We're at isfitshappy at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and on YouTube. And you can visit our website, isfitshappy.com. We have a bunch of links in there where you can get to any of those pages I just listed. Just let us know what you're thinking. We'd love to hear from you. See you next week. Okay, so now it's time for the favorite part of the episode. We're going to talk about some things that people have written in to us about. First, I'm going to start with um, a comment on Facebook from Cookie Baker. And this is for episode 154. Thank you. Chapter two. Yes. So Cookie Baker makes a comment that this is a chapter where they see what Kenneth likes about Etta, where Etta doesn't pretend to like him when she doesn't she doesn't fawn over his power or isn't in awe of his power i mean there's plenty of that but not like some of the sycophants that we yeah. see yeah yeah she she is able to speak her mind to him and it feels a little bit different than somebody who like sorcor right <laughs> and can it doesn't they say Kenneth doesn't like people who are awed by his power and then cow, he, how he can cow them easily because then they can turn on him the second they perceive him as weak, like Sa Adar. And that's why he wants to go after Vivesha as well, potentially, because he doesn't necessarily want a slave or an object. He wants someone he can win over and not be afraid they'll use power against him. And I think that's a really interesting point of view of looking at Kenneth in a different a different read than what I had thought of previously. I think that goes kind of hand in hand and it has grown on him with Etta. And it all stems from that village that Sorcor went to with the freed slaves, mm-hmm. in my opinion, where he's like, oh, you can have a lot of power and control from people who like you. Right. So I really think he's kind of expanding his repertoire of manipulations yeah definitely but i do like the idea that maybe that underlying feelings for etta that he ignores or yeah. pushes away that maybe there is more security and knowing that she doesn't pretend in front of him she makes right. it clear when she's not happy with him and yes she fixes that emotion right away but there is a sort of honesty to their relationship even though he is mostly putting on a front I think Kenneth despises people who try to hide things. Yes. Or have fronts to them or facades because he has one. (laughs) Yeah. And like, if he can see through it, you're not doing it well. True. But he always, because of his insecurities, is expecting everyone to have one. Right. Exactly. I don't know. That is a good thought about his personality and his quirks of how he views people, though. Yeah. So either way... It's a really interesting thought process behind what might draw him to Etta and Vivacia. Uh, I like it a lot. <laughs> um, Cookie Baker also has a comment of their theory on why the charm might dislike Ken so much. Yeah. So the idea is that, in their opinion, dragons view things in cycles rather than years because all the memories they have they're like so long lived and yeah it's, it's like, all repeating and it's yeah. all reliving rebirth re like turning into the next version of the same thing and so potentially because this charm knows it's a dragon and has that knowledge it's seeing can it become the the next iteration of igorit yeah like and hates him for that yeah, because the charm is also has a lot of, or all of Kenneth's memories, if we can believe it. So it kind of absorbed the hate that it had for Igrit. Yeah. 
and then is aware of how it thinks as a dragon or former dragon. Right. I don't know. So, it's interesting combination of things yeah. to lead to that conclusion. Yeah. Yeah, I do like the thought that the charm is Kenneth enough to dislike the Igret qualities in Kenneth as an adult. Yeah. I think that is a very compelling idea to me. I don't know. And we know in this world that cycles are a big deal and that the white prophet, basically beloved's whole goal is to get the cycle to stop continuing. He's trying to do things that take the world that keeps repeating events over and over and over again off of the track. Yeah. To a better events that right. would cycle around. Yeah. So having that on a smaller scale kind of makes sense. Mm hmm. As like a, a narrative yeah. device. But I don't know. Yeah. Very interesting. Definitely It's kind of a kind of a plot device of like you're becoming what you seek to destroy. Yeah. Yeah. It's I don't know. It's very complicated, but I do I do kind of enjoy seeing that insight and knowing like a different thought process of what's going on. So thank you, Cookie Baker, for bringing that to mm -hmm. our attention. They're not the only ones who are discussing the charm's intentions, though. Yes, we also got a very nice message from Jonas that is just as confused as we are as to what the charm is thinking and what's going on in its mind. Yeah, Jonas is talking about how some of the other characters, they Jonas can grasp like motivations and things like that. And we've had this discussion before about the charm. Yeah. The charm also eludes Jonas and how, you know, we've talked about on this podcast, different episodes of like, does it hate it, Kenneth? Does it like Kenneth a lot? Is it anywhere in between those two? Yeah. And so Jonas shows a couple examples here that kind of are contradictory. Right, like, does it does it even like Etta? Because Jonas brings up the plot point of if it liked Etta, why would it tell Kenneth to be nice to Etta when anyone who knows Kenneth would know that would make him be worse to Etta? Right. And then he mentions the fact that the charm's eyes sparkle whenever he is mean to Etta in response. Yeah, there's a glimmer in their eyes. And that's not necessarily a glimmer of anger. It's not described as It's probably like a it's probably like a glint or something. It's that's a Robin Hobb word, right? Right, yeah. Glint in the eye. I don't know. And that could be anger, but yeah, I It could also be amusement. Yeah. We just and don't know. Maybe it doesn't care about Etta. Yeah, so maybe it's using Etta to Maybe it is about hating Kennet and knows that Etta is a very valuable person to Kennet and is then trying to like hurt that relationship. I don't know. Yeah. Jonas ends that question with a lot of, well, ends that paragraph with a lot of questions saying, does it really like Etta? Does it speak truth when it says that it hates becoming a part of Kennet and is just out to hurt Kennet? What would happen if the charm were separated from Kennet? Is that what the charm wants ultimately? And what do you think about those last two? What would happen if they separated? We kind of know. It never speaks again after Etta has it. But is that because it chooses not to? Or is it because it can't? Right. Because we've talked about that too. Is it taking some sort of energy to speak sometimes or drawing strength from Kenneth because it's the bond partner there? Or... And, and once Kenneth is gone, it doesn't have that partner anymore. And they, I don't know. Or is it just choosing not to because its task is done to get rid of Kenneth or be gone from him? Mm. And is the goal just to leave Kenneth's side? Because it hates him that much? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I feel like the goal can't be to get rid of Kenneth because there have been too many opportunities when it could have gotten rid of Kenneth. And instead chose to help Kenneth. Right. So. It's a very, it's a big enigma. And I think that's why I like discussing it. Yeah. Because it is just that mystery character. I flip flop every single chapter. I'm like, yeah. oh yeah, definitely pro Kenneth. The charm loves Kenneth. And then I'm like, no, charm hates Kenneth. I don't know. <laughs> I can't decide, but I'm looking forward to 
seeing the ending of Kennet to figure out if that gives us any more insight. Right. <laughs> so thank you, Jonas, so much for those questions and agreeing with our frustration of what is going on and who whose side is this guy on. So thank you for that. And thank you to everyone who writes in and comments and participates um, with our social media pages. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to seeing everything you guys have to add for next week. <laughs>